Good afternoon, and thank you to the um, chairs for the opportunity to present today. So today I'm going to be talking about ARIS for gastric bypass. So here are my disclosures. I am a proctor for intuitive surgical and a speaker for gore. However, neither of these disclosures are relevant at all to what I'm going to be speaking about today. So first, I'm going to give you a bit of a background on enhanced recovery after surgery, how this applies to bariatric surgery specifically, and what the guidelines are now in regard to bariatric enhanced recovery after surgery, what the data shows in the literature, what some future initiatives are, and then what we can conclude from all of this. So in terms of a background of ARIS, obviously ARIS stands for enhanced recovery after surgery. And this really was initiated in 1997 by Dr. Henrik Collette in colorectal surgery. It was a research group of surgeons from Northern Europe. And they formulated the ARIS study group in 2001, which evolved into what we all know now as the ARIS Society. So the components of an ARIS pathway are that, that it's multidisciplinary. It takes the surgeon, nurses, anesthesia. There's many components to it. And the whole purpose is to transition from a tri traditional to a more evidence-based best practice approach for the patient, covering every aspect of perioperative care from pre-, intra-, and post-operative care. And obviously, the whole purpose of it and the goal is to optimize a patient's physiology after surgery to try to minimize physiologic stress and obviously improve perioperative outcomes. So this is a flow chart that we've all seen in regard to enhanced recovery after surgery. Just as a, as a general rule, you can see here that it's broken down into surgery, anesthesia, and nursing. So multidisciplinary component, really addressing every single aspect of the patient's care from pre-admission, educating the patient preoperatively, focusing on post-op nausea vomiting prophylaxis, carbohydrates, intraoperatively regional analgesia, staying away from opioids, and then postoperatively early mobilization, again, trying to stay away from opioids as much as possible, and close discharge follow-up. So how does this apply specifically to bariatric surgery? So these are all the consensus guidelines that have been published by the ARIS Society in the last um, over a decade now. And as you can see here, specifically in regard to bariatric surgery, the ARIS published their set of guidelines in 2016. So what were those guidelines that were published? So this was published in the World Journal of Surgery in 2016. And they broke down the recommendations based on exactly the flowchart that I had showed you before. So preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care. So some of the highlights they graded based on level of evidence and what the recommendation grade was. So preoperatively, obviously, the first thing they focused on was preoperative counseling. They had a strong recommendation grade for this. Regarding smoking cessation, tobacco should be stopped at least four weeks before surgery. Again, a strong recommendation. And then preoperative weight loss should be recommended as well. Um, not a ton of literature regarding that, but they still provided a strong recommendation for that. Also preoperatively, they recommended um, the use of dexamethasone, IV about an hour and a half prior to induction of anesthesia to help with post-op nausea vomiting prophylaxis as well as inflammatory response. In terms of pre-op fasting, they recommended that obese patients take clear liquids up to two hours prior to surgery. And then as an, a caveat to that, they also mentioned carbohydrate loading. So there's not a lot of data specifically in bariatric surgery yet regarding carbohydrate loading. So if you look at the level of evidence, it's pretty low to moderate, but still a strong recommendation grade, very much tied to the pre-op fasting state and trying to discourage that. Um, in the intraoperative period, focusing on what we all know as goal-directed fluid therapy, so ensuring not to overhydrate patients or dehydrate patients, especially if you have patients on a preoperative liquid diet, this is incredibly important. And then obviously a multimodal approach to post-op nausea vomiting prophylaxis, um, really trying to ensure that we can optimize their perioperative outcomes. Postoperatively, focusing a lot on multimodal analgesia using regional anesthesia, local anesthetics, trying to stay away from opioids, thromboprophylaxis to try to mitigate the potential complication of a DVT, so low molecular weight heparin in addition to me mechanical prophylaxis, 
early post-operative nutrition, so having patients drink the night of surgery and start their diet the next day as opposed to keeping them NPO. And finally, post-op oxygenation, especially in bariatric patients where there is such a high incidence of sleep apnea, it's incredibly per important to maintain their oxygenation, especially in, when you're dealing with healing and maximizing uh, tissue perfusion. So what does the data thus far show us in regard to these guidelines and how are institutions really applying this? So this was a recent study published by Vanderbilt University looking at their institution of enhanced recovery pathway and how this influenced opioid consumption and post-op nausea. So this was a single institution study. They looked at their enhanced recovery pathway both before and after implementation. They had about 360 patients before the ARIS pathway was instituted and over 700 patients after. So I thought this was a great pictorial depiction of essentially everything I've talked about thus far, really breaking everything down in terms of pre, intra, and post-operative care. Here they provide a carbohydrate drink the night before surgery and then the morning of, up to three hours before. They take gabapentin and Tylenol all the way in and try to um, help with multimodal analgesia by using a bilateral rectus sheath block scopolamine patch here for post-op nausea vom vomiting prophylaxis. So that's all preoperative. In regard to intraoperative opioid sparing analgesia with the use of a lidocaine infusion, post-op nausea vomiting prophylaxis like I had s told you before regarding the dexamethasone, um, and goal-directed fluid therapy here. Postoperatively, fluid balance, again, lots and lots of emphasis on multimodal analgesia, trying to stay away from opioids, no Foley's, no drains, early ambulation, early PO intake, and I think the most important thing is close follow-up with the patients after surgery to try to mitigate some of the potential complications. So what did they find from this study? So they did not find any difference in the proportion of patients discharged on postoperative day one. So as you can see, they have quite a high percentage of discharges on postoperative day one, between 79 to 83%. So that was not the factor in this study that was really affected. Additionally, length of stay was the same in both groups. But what they did find was that the usage of morphine equivalents was significantly less. So 41% of patients used uh, morphine equivalents compared to the 16.2% in the ARIS pathway, significantly less. In addition, anti-emetic administration was significantly less from almost 70% to 45%. And emergency department visits were almost half within the first seven days after surgery. So they found quite significant variables that didn't necessarily impact length of stay, but certainly impacted opioid use and post-op nausea vomiting. So what they concluded from this study is implementation of an enhanced recovery pathway after surgery in their bariatric population really didn't change their discharges, but it did reduce post-op opioid use, it did decrease anti-emetic use, and it did decrease emergency department visits within the first week after surgery. This was a recent meta-analysis published in the Journal of GI Surgery in 2018 looking at all the enhanced recovery protocols in bariatric surgery, 13 studies, over 6,000 patients. In this meta-analysis, about 70% of patients had enhanced recovery pathway versus 30% with the traditional pathway. These are some forest plots of the main findings that they identified, and as you can see here, the length of stay does favor the enhanced recovery pathway with a decreased length of stay by 1.5 days. And in terms of overall morbidity, additionally, this favored the enhanced recovery pathway with an odds ratio of 0.7. So they found significantly decreased lengths of stay and morbidity in patients who had an enhanced recovery pathway versus the traditional pathway. So what are some future initiatives? So um, the ACS and ASMBS have combined to create an initiative called Employing New Enhanced Recovery Goals for Bariatric Surgery, or the Energy Initiative. This was a pilot initiative that was started in July of 2017. This consists of 36 centers that were identified by the MBSAQIP database with high outlier readmission rates and really with the goal of trying to minimize their uh, risk of uh, readmission and complications. So all of these centers were put through a 28-point enhanced recovery protocol. And here are the components of the energy initiative. Again, all of these things are very similar to what I've discussed before, preoperatively focusing on setting expectations for the day of surgery, really defining those goals for the patients, intraoperatively avoiding opioids, post-op nausea, vomiting, prophylaxis, goal-directed fluid therapy, 
postoperatively starting liquids right away, early ambulation, non-opioids, scheduling antiemetics, and all of those components that we've talked about before. And then another component that they added as well was in regard to discharges. So providing patients prescriptions for pain medications and for nausea medications, um, extended VTE prophylaxis if needed, and really importantly here, discharge numbers to provide the patients to contact the centers if there are any issues develop, and then scheduling that initial post-operative visit so the patient knows what to expect. So in their interim analysis of six months of data that um, Dr. Brett Hauer presented at ACS, this was about 4,700 patients, 60% sleeves, 40% bypasses. And what they found was that the length of stay was significantly decreased from 2.2 to 1.7 days, which was statistically significant. They decreased the extended length of stay as well, which they defined as greater than four days, almost by half from eight to 4%. And then they did find also increased compliance with the protocol as the study continued as the initiative continued. So initially, the compliance was only about 26%, but this improved to about 80% as the initiative continued on. So what can we conclude from all of this? So there are established ARIS guidelines in bariatric surgery, really with focusing on the goal of optimizing pre-, intra-, and post-operative care. Obviously, enhanced recoveries after surgery is increasingly being implemented about, among bariatric centers, showing us decreased length of stay, nausea, opioid use, and emergency department admissions. And there is a large-scale enhanced recovery project in bariatric surgery that is in progress that we know as the Energy Initiative. Thank you. Thank you.